Paper and Glam Reading Family, welcome to our October installment of the Paper and Glam Book Club. Today we are discussing our October selection, which is Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. Riley Sager is actually a pseudonym for a journalist. He is a male journalist, so I actually thought he was a she. And yeah, he writes this and actually other books under um, a different name. So I guess he wants to keep his thriller identity a secret. I'm really excited to discuss this book tonight. It was the most perfect, just atmospheric Halloween you read. We typically do a quote unquote witch book almost every year for October because I love me some witch books for Glamoween. But this year we are just doing a good old fashioned thriller and man, it had a great payout. But before we get started, we have a wonderful icebreaker to get us in the spirit of all things books and reading. And our icebreaker is how do you create ambiance and atmosphere for your fall reading? Is there music you listen to or candles you burn, snacks that pair well, etc. And if you have any ideas for atmosphere pairings for our November read, um, we would love to hear them. So I love to snack on the Trader Joe's maple kettle corn in the fall when I read or watch movies. I typically have a fall candle burning. Right now I'm buttering a um, fresh fall morning. I don't know if you guys can see that it's lit, but it's there. And yeah, Anna, librarian Anna, the official Paper and Glam librarian, turned me on to these amazing YouTube ambiances. And I'll let her explain in more detail what they are. But I went crazy finding like reading ambiances that go with every month. And I've been working on this like beast seasonal living undertaking for when we launch our seasonal living community, which I've been working on for years and years and it's getting closer and closer. And it's just so much fun finding these these like YouTube atmospheres for every month where there's like music and, a, and like really beautiful like animated graphics. Okay, Anna, I'm gonna let you take over because I'm clearly not explaining this well. No, you're doing great. Um, yeah, so literally like Lisa Marie said, it's just these YouTube videos where people have kind of turned um, beautiful images into GIFs or it'll sometimes it'll even just be a picture um, and it's paired with kind of ASMR style sounds. Um, often you'll hear about it like with like meditation apps will often do these as well where it's like you'll hear like the sound of a bubbling brook or you'll hear um like cafe jazz or um but this one actually pairs it with a scene um i first discovered um through ambient worlds about a year or so ago um they create scenes from popular literature so they have ones from lord of the rings and harry potter and i would use them a lot when my husband would game um or if he was out of town and i'm like trying to sleep alone <laughs> and so it's just like kind of that calming sound. Um, right now, my two favorites are Autumn Cozy on YouTube and Calm to My Nature. Um, and I picked up a manor house style um, kind of haunted house for when I was reading Lock Every Door. Um, but I haven't found one for November's book yet, but I actually haven't looked too much into Campaign Widows just yet. So... Before we move on to the, um, I was gonna say, is the cozy is the autumn cozy one a channel or is that a video? Both of those are channels. Okay, cool. That's I haven't seen that one. Yeah, calm, you turned me on to Calm by Nature and Ambient World, and those are incredible. They have one for like Downton Abbey and Peter Pan and Cinderella, and I fell down a deep rabbit hole, like pairing them with each month of reading. It was a wonderful time, you guys. And we're gonna start talking about those on a seasonal living live stream that is coming soon. Um, alrighty, Miss D, how do you set the scene? You've been reading up a storm with fall publishing. Um, kind of, sort of. <laughs> uh, this month, um, I struggled last month to read and this month hasn't been my um, hottest, hottest month. Um, I just, it's just been a lot going on. I mean, I say, I, everyone's saying that every month, but I do have a fall blanket that I bought at um, Home Goods. I wish I should have brought it with me. I don't know why, um, but it's really cozy and it has pumpkins all over it. And that's pretty much how I set the tone. Um, I have different fall 
coffees. Um, I like the maple uh, type of flavored coffees. I do like some pumpkin coffee, but um, you know, I've kind of outgrown the pumpkin coffee per se. I like uh, more of the maple brown sugar, and then I also like the peppermint um, coffee. Um, I'm already starting to drink the peppermint bark uh, coffee, even though um, it's still fall, but I just love the taste. So yeah, that's pretty much how I read uh, seasonally. Um, so I usually have coffee or tea to drink if it's not at bedtime, because I read a lot at bedtime. So then like, then there's no ambiance because my husband's like asleep. So I can't be like, burning candles and, and like setting the house on fire by falling asleep with candle burning. But if I'm like carving out time to read, like typically on a weekend, then I'll have either coffee or tea and I'm trying to not drink as much coffee. So I've been drinking, um, I got the pumpkin spice tea from, um, Ticino and they are coffees. They're teas that, um, mimic coffee. So they are like chicory, based teas or um, like mushroom based teas. And so, and they do, they look like coffee. They, I wouldn't say they taste exactly like coffee, but close enough. Um, and so I've been drinking that one. I have um, some other flavors, like I got the raspberry mocha one, like at Valentine's day time. And, um, and I found them through Sip Spy, which is like a subscription box. So they, they'll do like seasonal subscriptions too, like where you can just do like, the seasonal box and so that's how I found it was from last year's seasonal box um and so I'll just do that and I have a cozy blanket too I have a couple of different cozy blankets that I really like and I just snuggle up in on my couch and I have my little book bean from book bow to rest my elbows on and um and it's really cozy too because it has like the black and white uh buffalo plaid like a d shirt but black and white so it's really cute and it, um, I don't know, that's kind of what I have. And oh, and a candle, if I'm not doing bedtime, a candle or my um, my diffuser, my essential oil diffuser with like a fall time essential oil. But I was thinking for next month, I'm really gonna try to read the whole book like between the first and the third, like for election day. Like that's my goals. So, like I want it to be like election day craziness so that I get like the feeling that I, I'm assuming the campaign widows feel. Yeah, so I am maybe a third of the way through campaign widows. And if you're just joining us, we, um, we actually release all of our titles at the beginning of each year. So it's in November every year, we release all of our titles for the year. So you know what you're reading all year long. They're always kind of seasonal and atmospheric. So this year we're reading a book next month called campaign widows and it is so good um it's very very election mania so the book starts off at the iowa caucus and then goes all the way through election season so i um finished lock every door within like two days and i have been i read uh, american royals since i sat that one out and and now i'm doing campaign widows and it's just like the perfect election season pick. So if you feel like you want some atmospheric election reads, I can't recommend our July pick, uh, American Royals, and our next pick, uh, Campaign Widows More. They're both so, so fun and really capture all the, just everything that goes along with election series and all of its scandal and silliness and, and just fun. So um, yeah, and also along those same lines, patrons right now are choosing our books for 2021. So if you are reading along with us, I would love your support over on Patreon. Paper and Glam Book Club is going to be going to Patreon exclusively with 2021. And so if you join now, you can vote on all of our titles for next year. There's live streams. There's two, one for January through June, which is all the books up for your vote the first half of 2021. And then the, there's one that's July through December with the books up for the second half of 2021. And you can vote now through election day. We thought that'd be really cute to end the other vote on election day for our 2021 titles. And you also get access to all of the live streams we've done all year. And they're on all things books and reading. And we've just had so much fun together, just reading and 
just talking about the reading life and becoming better readers together. So the link for that is right down below and I'm excited to see you over on Patreon. It's $5 a month, so it's really, really affordable and it goes a long way in making this community of readers happen. All right, so our first question. Oh, before I get started, Jaina, I love your Glamoline outfit here. Like your shirt, your lipstick. She even has an Adams Family phone case. Like look at that cute little shirt. She's just like Glamoline so hard. It's making me so happy. <laughs> I have my little bat, my bat shirt on, so yeah. All right, our first question, as always, is what was your experience reading Lock Every Door and how many doors would you rate it? We always do a fun emoji rating system. So I love this book. I, like I said, this is one of the most compulsively reading, like compulsively readable books I've had experienced a long time. It's very rare for me to just like roll through a book in a weekend, but I read this and had all the questions done literally within like a Saturday or Sunday. It was like the first weekend in October. It was wonderful. And I really was caps encapsulated by the story. When I would put down the book, I just found myself like still living in the world and still like wanting to get back into that world as soon as possible. And after I finished the book, like I was still found myself thinking about it, still thinking about just like the atmosphere of the building. And to me as someone who really looks for a strong sense of place or atmosphere in my books and a really, really strong plot narrative, this really fit the bill for what I was looking for and was just so festive and glamoweeny. Um, so yeah. That was my experience. I did the audio and I read it. I usually check out the audio from my library and then I kind of follow along in the hardcover. There were some really beautiful quotes that I thought that just felt really almost like prophetic for the season. A lot of our reads this year have been just really, really aligned with a lot of just the themes of 2020. And um, so on page, uh, this is the first chapter on page 12, she says, every so often life offers you a reset button. When it does, you need to press it as hard as you can. And for me, 2020 has definitely been a really hard, really difficult reset, more of like a reset and a detox, where it's just like, taking everything in my life and my business down to the studs and figuring out how to rebuild it in a way that's more sustainable. And yeah, I just love that because I do feel like we'll look back on 2020 and feel like it was a defining year for, for all of us. And then on page 77, there was a really beautiful fall quote. And I, I just love that this book was set in fall, set on Halloween, just wonderful. It says, we spend the next few minutes doing nothing but looking out at the lake and feeling the breeze on our skin. It rustles the branches of the trees around us, their golden leaves quivering. Quite a few let go and drift to the ground like confetti. I just love that quote, just the idea that leaves are like nature's confetti. I didn't, I haven't really done any seasonal living this year, um, the great gap year that is 2020, and I was kind of bummed about it. And then I was thinking like, nature always decorates, right? Like, I love that. Like, nature decorates. If we don't get to it, it's okay. Nature decorates for us. And I just love that. Like, it's almost like 2020 is almost over. Let's like drop the confetti. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was my experience reading Lock Every Door. How did you uh, enjoy it, Miss Anna? Yeah, so I've actually seen this book everywhere since it came out. Um, and one of my coworkers is actually a really big fan of Riley Sager and particularly, particularly this title. So when I saw that it popped up on our 2020 list, I knew it, I knew at least I had to give it a shot. Um, I did have a hard time picking it up at the beginning of the month. I don't know why, but it was just kind of, it definitely felt like one of those books that it's like, you have to be in the right like state to like sit through it, sit through the whole thing. You can't just like pick at it. Um, but I actually was on a long car trip to California earlier this month. So uh, I ended up binging it through that and I ended up getting a solid four doors from me at the very beginning. Um, but the more I thought about it, I kind of like went back down to a three door, um, even though like it was perfect for October and it was amazing just like making me think and making me feel. Um, there are some parts of the writing style that I was just kind of like mm, not as strongly as I thought it was going to be. Uh, um, 
but that quote at the from the very beginning of the book is definitely one that I highlighted in my Kindle a million times. Um, and definitely, yeah, 2020 is definitely a year of kind of getting back to basics and like finding out what really matters. So I really appreciated the that quote particularly. What about you, Dee? Um, I really enjoyed this book. I gave it four or close to five doors. I thought that it moved pretty fast and good. It didn't drag at all um, for me. And y'all know I love, um, I read a lot of mystery thriller throughout the year. So I'm very um, particular. Um, I don't want to say particular like I'm snobby, but <laughs> um, I just, I know what I like. And I like books with psychological uh, twists and things like that. So um, I enjoyed the twist, um, even though I kind of knew who might have been dealing with the disappearances. I didn't think that it was what it ended up being. So I just thought like the concept was really, uh, really, really good. So I really enjoyed it. I finished it in like two days. So really good. So I started it on um, going, leaving California, <laughs> so the opposite of Anna, um, on our way to Utah for fall break. We went and stayed, um, well, we stayed at a hotel, but we went to see my sister-in-law. And then, so I just read it like every night in the hotel room for like three or four nights. Um, so I guess that's kind of like apartment E and that's the closest to like because California apartments like in like suburbia aren't like these kind of apartments at all. They're like more like external. So when I lived in an apartment, it wasn't like this, it wasn't a building. Um, so that's, you know, a hotel is like the closest to apartment -y that I could get to read it, right? So I was kind of in the proper setting and um, yeah, I liked it. I think I gave it four doors on my Goodreads. Um, you know, uh, thing for enjoyability and stuff. I know that some people said there's predictable elements and there were definitely like things I knew were going to happen, but I find that in almost all mystery thrillers, there are things I knew were going to happen, even in like Gone Girl, which I know is like some people's like favorite thriller of all time, but there were things that like, I just wasn't surprised by that other people were. Um, so I think, that's not like that doesn't kill a thriller for me because most thrillers I can predict a sh decent chunk of what's going on but I don't read them for that I read them to see if I'm right and I like to be right so I don't mind if I predict it correctly um and you know just to like be in that atmosphere like Lisa Marie said I really enjoyed that and that's what I want to kind of experience and enjoy and like Lisa Marie was pointing out some stuff like something that stood out to me that was really like funny and I think it's just because of like where working in a high school and stuff, but like on page 225, um, when she's meeting up with another apartment center, like he hands her a Justin school ring and that's who our vendor is for class rings. And so like I highlighted that and like, I was like, look, that's who we use. And like, that's who my grandma's class ring was from. And so I just feel like it's like such a piece of like Americana that's just like suddenly like put into the text. So I noticed little things like that. That is actually a really beautiful segue into our next question. And you know, Jaina, you reminded me of something I didn't say when I was talking about reading this book is the building in this book reminded me so much of the building I lived in LA for the last five years. It was built in the 20s. It is like this big giant, like it almost looks like a big mansion. It's like full of celebrities and um, like, yeah, it's, super interesting and I kept having like nightmares that I was still in LA and trying to get out and I was like trapped in this apartment building and you know if you're new to paper and glam I actually moved kind of really spontaneously for a variety of reasons which for the grace of God because I got home like moments before COVID broke and I was supposed to move in July I ended up moving four months early and um, so <laughs> I kept having these dreams that it was COVID. I was stuck in my house, couldn't leave, and I just wanted to go home. And I literally would wake up in the middle of the night being like, oh, wait, I'm already home. Okay, this was just a 
a dream because the apartment building just reminded me so much of my building in LA. So yeah, it was almost like God being like, I'm one step ahead of you. It was like a little wink from the Lord. Um, but to your point, Jaina, number two really talks about the way our books intersect with our lives. So our second question is, this is the second book we've read in a row with the plot revolving around a book. We love books about books here at the Paper and Glam reading community. So we have quite a few on next year's list for your selection. It's like the Emmys. In, in LA, all during Emmy season, um, like every billboard says, for your consideration. And I felt like that when I was doing the live stream patron pre preview of all of our titles. It was like, for your consideration. So, um, so uh, our September selection, John Cohen's Harry Street, is also revolved around a book and this whole idea of the intersection between real life and fantasy. So there's quite a few quotes in Lock Every Door that really pull out this motif. So the first one is on page 114, and this is Greta Manville talking about her book, all based on this building. It says, when I wrote that book, I was so in need of fantasy that I failed to do the one thing all good writers are supposed to do, tell the truth. I was a liar, and that book is my biggest lie. And in Harry's Trees, the, the librarian character says, you know, you wanted a fairy tale, and I'm sorry, the fairy tale told you something true about life. And for me, as someone who's like, just loves the art and science of living, I really read for those little, just moments where a book articulates something really beautiful about the human experience, or has like someone telling my own life back to me, like Jaina was saying. And I think that I'm always looking for truth when I read. That's why I love to study the Bible and, um, but like how much of our own narrative is like truth and how much is fantasy, right? So she goes on to say, you regretting, you're forgetting that readers need fantasy too. And this is um, the main character talking back to Greta after she says that she, her book was a lie. And um, so she says back to her, you're forgetting that readers need fantasy too. My sister and I used to lie on, on her bed, reading Heart of a Dreamer and picturing ourselves in guinea shoes. The book showed us that there was life outside our tiny dying town. The book gave us hope. Even now, after all of that hope has been stripped away, I still love Heart of a Dreamer and I remain grateful that you wrote it. Sure, the Manhattan in the book doesn't exist in real life. And no, few people in this city end up getting the happy ending Ginny received or Ginny received. But fiction can be an escape, which is why we need idealized versions of New York City. It balances out the crowded, gritty, heartbreaking real thing. I thought that was so incredibly beautiful and just such a beautiful picture of their reading life too. I think that, you know, we've all needed some fantasy this year and real life has felt a lot like waking up in a science fiction novel, especially for us in California. It's like every, like for the last three months, it's like we've had new fires. Um, I was reading Gavin Newsom said that 42 fires sparked in the last 48 hours, which is just insane. Um, there's crazy fires in Orange County right now. Luckily, we're spared here in Northern California. But um, yeah, it's just like, just like doesn't stop. And um, then on page 245 and 246, um, Greta and the main character continue this very same conversation like 100 pages later. And she says, never confuse fiction with reality. No good ever comes of it. There are two types of people in this world, dear. Those who look at that wallpaper and see only flowers and those who would see only faces. Fantasy versus, versus reality. At first, I thought you were one of those people who only sees the flowers, head in the clouds, prone to flights of fancy. Now I know better. You see the faces, don't, don't you? I give her a quick nod. That means you're a realist. What about you, I say? I see both at once and decide which is more important to focus on, which I suppose makes me a pragmatist. But today, I choose to focus on the flowers. Um, so yeah, oh, fantasy and fiction. I'm not sure I have a well-articulated answer to this question, um, but I tend to like narrate my life. You know, I'm an Enneagram 4, so I see kind of my whole life as a story. I see like all, all of life is like an unfolding narrative. And yeah, I don't know. like. I almost have like my own folklore going. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> Did you have any thoughts on this one, Anna? 
Yeah, so I'm kind of in the same boat as you as my answer is not very well articulated, but I personally tend to swing uh, between super undaunted optimism and terrible pessimism on a regular basis. So a lot of people say that I live in a fantasy world because I'm not always, I'm not always the most pragmatic person, but also other times I'm too pragmatic. Um, there is very rarely an in-between. Um, but it's funny that you brought up the line on 245 where she, uh, she and Greta are talking about the wallpaper because I really love that quote. And I really related to that just because our lives in general are not always horrible things, but they're not always happy, happy-go-lucky things either. And so Greta's saying that she, ha- she sees both, but she has to pick which one she's going to focus on each day. And it's like that, honestly, that like, honestly, even still makes me think of seasonal living in general, just because it's like, yeah, we can have like, no matter what's going on, you have these like wonderful things that happen every season, like with the leaves changing color, the, um, in the fall, you have the beauty that is just the Christmas season in winter and just that kind of slow down, kind of heavy weather in the summer no matter where you live like those always happen and so you always have to focus on those even if like we're living in a pandemic (laughs) or um like in Jules's case like she's living in literally a horror novel novel now so um and so I just really love that and yeah I think reading kind of makes everybody optimistic not optimistic but um empathetic and so you kind of have to live in that fantasy world of being able to see the good in people and being able to relate to people, even if you're not going through those same things. What about you, Dee? Yeah, y'all know I'm not smart, so I'm going to um, try to answer this as best I can. Um, but I you're very like, smart, Dee. Um, <laughs> I am so, oh, well, thank you. Um, but so I read mostly fiction. Um, I like mystery thriller and I like romance. Um, I love to read romance almost like a cleanser, um, palette cleanser, because sometimes I just, if the world is just too serious, I just need something light and happy. Um, but also nonfiction is just so heavy. Uh, I am currently reading Cast, and I started reading that probably the middle of October, and it is written very beautifully. Um, She's going back and forth between, um, you know, history and then her own personal um, experience, and it's just really uh, difficult for me to read, um, especially heavy um, nonfiction books like that. Um, like when I started reading, I, um, Stamp from the Beginning, uh, the same author who wrote, um, How to Be Anti-Racist. Yeah, Stamp from the Beginning is very, very difficult. Um, you know, it's discussing how, um, you know, Black people are just viewed as the bottom of the barrel people from the beginning of time. And when I read, I don't want to read that. Like, it's enough to just wake up every day and um, just live life. So I just have to really just focus and, um, yeah, when it comes to nonfiction, because it's just like so heavy and it just almost makes me upset um so yeah I prefer um yeah (laughs) fiction fiction um all day and if and like I said if anyone ever needs like um just whatever type of books that you need to read just for a palate cleanser I know some uh people like to read sci-fi weird science books about animals um that's what makes them happy um me I like to read romantic comedies um another um person said that they sometimes like to read uh children's books like the dog man books so um yeah just whatever um it takes sometimes you just um have to get away and even though they do have some real life situations in them um it's still an escape
yeah, I'm, I think that, um, sorry, I'm also going to not articulate this. I thought I was going to, and then now it's all gone, like out of my brain, like 2020 style. Right. Um, so I read a lot of everything. Like I'm, I know some people like have preferences. My main preference is just not romance. It's like not my thing, which is really funny because in real life, like I'm super mushy. I'm like, hold my hand while we fall asleep together. And my husband's like, why, why do you want to touch me? Like, it's hot. Like what? Um, <laughs> like, like you're my knight in shining armor. Like I'm super mushy and stuff in real life, but like, I don't want to read a romance. And I think part of why I don't want to read romance is I think that there's a lot of like, um, untruths, let's call them that untruths in romance that set up, um, a false sense of what people should be looking for in their relationships. And so I think that's part of what uh, turns me off to rom for romance. Sorry, D made me think of a book and I'm trying to like remember the name. So I'm looking through my uh, Goodreads to find, um, she said something about like that line of like truth and like fantasy. And I don't know D if you've read Black Girl Unlimited, but um, it's, it's written like it's her memoir in a lot of ways the author says but then there's this like magical realism element to it so it looks at a lot of those same hard truths that you were discussing but it has like this magical realism she's a witch kind of thing going on too i think to help like temper that and also to show some like um cultural like historical cultural like um like women being strong but called witches you know in different cultures and stuff if they were strong and and spoke out so it's really it's a really beautifully written book it came out in uh, january i think so it's a really good book but um for me yeah i just like i think that that idea of fantasy like lisa marie was saying that's in fiction so it doesn't have to necessarily be like fantasy but like a pretend world right it's not us and like living things out that way, it allows us to dress our, address our fears and our desires without maybe not like having to go through it ourselves. So we get to kind of like live in all of these different worlds and experience different things and kind of imagine it, right? Like if you read um, Call of the Wild, you can imagine what it's like to have to go to the Yukon and live in the snow. And then you can also know that you do not want to travel in the snow, even though the main character is a dog. And so I think it allows us to have, um, like Anna said, empathy. We get to see stories from a different perspective. And it just broadens, like, our whole experience. Like, I don't want to read about people like me. That's never been um, something I desire because I know about me. So I don't need to read about me. I want to read lots of different stories about lots of different kinds of people living in different areas and doing different things. Um, whether it's based in history or if it's complete fantasy sci-fi. I just want to kind of explore different things. And even fantasy and sci-fi show us how to be empathetic toward other people. And I actually have like tons of TED Talks that I share with my class on this like exact issue, like of like university studies where they like, you read a story about someone of this culture and like you look at a picture and like, are you more empathetic? And they say like, who's the criminal? Um, and the difference between someone who's read the story versus someone who hasn't um, and their likelihood of like who they identify. And so it's just really interesting that like, it's even scientifically based. It's not just like us discussing it and feeling this way. It's, it's true. It's fact. Um, and so I just think that that increased empathy and knowledge about other people and other cultures is what I like about fantasy and fiction and even nonfiction, of course, because nonfiction is like the ultimate way to learn about other people. I just don't like um, self-growth nonfiction that much because I want to learn stories. I like story. I'm kind of the opposite. I love nonfiction. I am such a nonfiction reader. Um, but yeah, it's, it's even been heavy for me this year, like to Dee's point. I have said, you know, for the first time in my life, I took a like reading sabbatical because I literally couldn't absorb any more information. And usually reading is the through line 
in my day, it's the through line in my whole life. I, like my day is bookended by reading. I start the day with, I wake up early to read for an hour and then I like get in bed at nine so I can read for like an hour and a half. And uh, so to have like four-ish months where I didn't want to read at all, it's just crazy. But I, I also now coming back to reading, I have not been wanting to read too much nonfiction, which is like a little bit like having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> Um, yeah, I also was thinking more about this question about just the very thin line between fantasy and fiction, um, especially as someone who just moved from LA, like it's so clear in that culture that like everyone's living their own story, right? Everyone's starring, starring in their own movie. And I was thinking about how much our brain really doesn't know the difference between fact and like fiction. It only knows like what we tell it. And I was also thinking about how that's so true because I kept having nightmares about being stuck in LA. I was having nightmares about being stuck in my old apartment building and not being able to move home and also being stuck in like the Roosevelt Hotel, like the tower of the Roosevelt Hotel that I could see out of my balcony in LA, which is like an old haunted tower that really reminds me very much of this book. Um, but yeah, like it's just, it's very interesting the way that like our brains take in story and just the way that we're meant to live in story, we're meant to um, consume story. And of course, like Jesus taught in story for a reason, that story is the bridge we use to walk from kind of one heart to another, from one experience to another, just like Jaina was saying, from one life to another. And it really, it really does cultivate empathy. And I just love that. All right, our third question is, are the poems Ingrid sent Jules significant? I didn't see a tie, but when there's an authorial literary flex, it's time to do some digging. So I added page numbers for you guys if you want to go back and see where these poems are. And then librarian Anna actually linked all of the poems so you can read them and see how they fit in. And our, our resident literature professor is going to walk us through this poem situation because she teaches these for a living. So there's no one better equipped to tell us how this literary flex ties into the story itself. And I just was expressing gratitude behind the scenes here for our book chatters, you guys. We have a librarian and librarian Anna. We have a bookseller in D and of course Jaina, our literature professor. We've got three people who do books, books, books all day, every day. And I'm just so grateful that um, they found us and have been with me since the very beginning. And I'm grateful that you found me too. I, I don't believe that, you know, we are anywhere by accident, right? I know that, like, I think you were guided to me and paper and glam. And I just love the way that, that God opens up, like, the right doors at the right time um, with the right people. So, uh, anyway, Jaina, would you break down this poetry situation for us? Well, the first two are about, um, obviously, about death. Um, I could not stop for death. Um, is the first line of the Dickinson poem. All her poems are titled by their first line because she didn't title any of her poems. And this poem is about like, you're just living your life and you don't have time to be like, oh, death, come and, and get me. Um, instead, it's, it's death is going to stop for you and he's going to come and collect you because you don't have time to stop for death because you are living your life and you're moving on. And remember is very similar in tone about remember me for all of these, for my living. And so it's about like, you need to be living. And I think that Jules in a lot of ways, like um, with all the stuff that happens at the beginning, she's not living, you know, properly. And so this is kind of like where that happens. And then she realizes like she needs to go and live, right? Like um, by the end. Fire and Ice is a really interesting poem um, because it poses the question of which is worse to die by, fire or ice. And essentially in the end, um, he says, if he had to die twice, he would die once by each. And because they're equal, um, they both are equally horrible and both, you know, have have benefits of like their quickness or their slowness and so there are ups and downs of both sides so essentially like no matter how you die it's going to not be pleasant and hopefully it will happen fast um 
I know Anna looked into the bells a little bit more. And so I don't know if Anna wanted to speak on the bells because she said this one spoke to her. Yeah, so um, I was actually a terrible English major that when I was reading these, I didn't actually look up the poems and I kind of wish I, th that I did now. Um, but I went back and read The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe because it was the only one that I really wasn't familiar with. And it's just so significant because like the first part, so it's broken down into three, into four parts. Um, and the first part is hear the sledges with the bells and it's kind of, it sounds like a Chris, it almost sounds like silver bells by Christmas, um, the Christmas song. And so he's talking about, it's like, everything is beautiful. It's great. The bells are a wonderful sound to be able to hear. Um, and the just life is going great. Um, obviously we know that this was not true for Jules <laughs> um, at the beginning of this book, but it kind of like moves into she gets a second chance that, that chance to restart and to be able to kind of get a new lease on life and she's living in this super fancy apartment and with all these glamorous people around she gets to meet um the author of her sister's favorite book um but then the second stage the like you kind of like it kind of goes into where Jules is like something's not quite right something's kind of odd um and so but you're still just kind of like living on the high of how it's like what luck to be able to live in the Bartholomew um but then all of a sudden in stanza three it completely changes it's like something is wrong I have to figure out what's wrong and I kind of equated this with when Jules uh not Jules when Inger disappears um because that was kind of like the last part of um Jules kind of believing everything was okay she's just overreacting it's like no something is not right in this apartment building um and then when it goes into four is like the last part of the book um with all of the horrible things that happened in the last half of the book and just kind of like realizing it's like the sound can be happy but it also is absolutely terrible and terrifying and um, kind of the descent to madness that we follow um, with just the Bartholomew itself. I love the way you put that, Anna, and I feel like you just articulated what I was trying to articulate in the question about fact and fantasy, and that's really what <laughs> this book was, is like just a descent into madness and what, and like the whole time Jewel's trying to decide like, is this in my head or is this real? And that also is kind of a lot of what 2020 has felt like, right? Is this like just trying to maintain sanity as things just get more and more ridiculous <laughs> and nonsensical and like feel like living in like an apocalyptic Alice in Wonderland. Uh, so I love, I love that. It really is about just like this descent to madness. Um, all right. Uh, so the next question, um, is about haunted, cue Beyonce haunted. How does lock every door explore what it means to be haunted by the past, both our own and the past of the places we occupy? Have you ever been haunted by the past? So this quote, this question was inspired by the quote on page 78 that is Jules talking, um, or excuse me, it's um, Ingrid talking. She says, do you think it's possible for a place to be haunted even if there aren't any ghosts there, she says, because that's what it feels like to me. Like the Bartholomew is haunted by its history. Like all the bad stuff that ever happened there has accumulated like dust and now floats in the air and we're breathing it in Jules. Um, this is something I think about a lot, um, something I think about a lot, and I'm sure if you guys have been around Paper and Glam, you've probably heard me talk about this, that like 96% of the world is just energy and only 4% is actually physical. Um, and, you know, we know that there's a ton of Netflix documentaries and, and tons have been written on the fact that like our thoughts, of course, have very material impact on our bodies. And um, 
I also just think, you know, we've all walked into places that just feel like, feel really great. You know, like walking into my social club in LA, like it was like drinking a cup of coffee. Like I just felt like, oh, I'm inspired, I'm empowered. It just feels great. And then there's places that you walk into that just like weigh you down. You know, maybe it's like a tough work situation. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's like you went, like me, when you were a kid, you went to the Winchester Mystery House and you're still scared because it feels haunted, you know? So this idea of just like energy and the way it affects our emotions and affects, um, affects our body is just something I think, I think about a lot. Um, especially when, you know, you're in, um, places like, you know, maybe like LA or New York, like I think of like the Ravenswood in LA, which is across the street from my uh, building in LA. And I, I toured that one because it's much less expensive but the, than the one I lived in, uh, but it's also haunted. Like Mae West died there. And like I was walking through the halls and I was like, this place is legit haunted. Like I could feel it. And it's also super like art deco and like it has like gothic vibes. And yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I definitely think things are like, like places take on the energy of like everything that has happened in that place. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I believe that the Bartholomew probably felt like that. And I think that the Bartholomew was inspired by the Dakota in New York and Riley Sager in the very beginning of the book, um, even references the Dakota because I was like, I wonder if they're like, if I wonder if he's going to come out and say it. And he did. And that's like a, you know, a, a a building that has kind of all the folklore of the Bartholomew um, in real life. So, so yeah, that's, that's the question. Uh, did you have any thoughts, Miss Anna? So I think for Lock Every Door, it's Riley Sager did a really good job at creating a sense of place and atmosphere, um, particularly with the Bartholomew. So even though it was honestly just the backdrop, it always, it always feels like it was its own character within the book. Um, at least for me. And so, and then the more that we learned about its past and the people who lived there, it almost seemed like it was, hold, it was holding its breath while Jules was trying to figure out like what to do with the information that she has. Um, and we all carry some sort of baggage from our past as individuals and even places can also hold those as well. So good or bad and those old ghosts will always be kind of following us around but it's up to us like Jules to kind of figure out what we're going to do with them um are we going to let them bog us down or are we going to kind of use them as a way to move forward um but there's definitely a place that I want to I want to visit that this book keeps making me think of and it's the Tower of London um because everybody always says that like it has that sense of being haunted by the past and I'm obsessed with Tudor history and so I kind of like have to go to see where like Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard were um, beheaded and stayed as well um, but yeah. That's such a good point Anna. Um, I love Tudor history as well. I think we've bonded over our mutual love of the Tudors and Philippa Gregory novels. Um, but yeah, there's also a lot of documentaries that I love to watch on like Amazon and Netflix about like the Tower of London and all of these. Um, they walk you through like all these places and like tell you what happened. And you can even like feel it on the camera. You know, it's bananas. And it's like when you go to Europe, you go to these places that are like centuries old. It's, it's like you can feel the history of it. And that's such a, that's such a good point. I love that. Um, sorry, D, I, I interjected. Do you have any thoughts on the haunting of places? Oh, yeah, um, it's real. I've actually um, been to the Tower of London, Anna, and it is super creepy. And um, I am haunted. Um, I went to Madame Tussauds. I don't know if I'm saying that right. The wax, famous wax museum in London. And there is a section, and mind you, I was in the fourth grade at the time, but there is a whole section of it where they show different wax figures of how they used to torture people <laughs> and kill people. And I don't know why we, I was like in this section as a child. I guess my parents are just trying to expose me. But there are scenes that I've that are 
like haunted in my mind from that. And one specifically is the guy like out on the, when they used to do the stretcher, that is like terrifying. Like think of like seeing that as a child, <laughs> like, yeah. And then also a um, little funny fact is that our square is haunted um, where I work currently. So there's a haunted tour that's been going on since July. Um, and they go to different areas in the square. And what happened was there was this huge um, train crash back in whatever, like very, 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 very long time ago. And they um, wait the bodies out in the middle of the square for people to identify them. So that's why they say the square is um, haunted. Um, our store is definitely haunted. Um, I'm sure these apps aren't legit, but there's some, been somebody who's came in with the app, like one of those ghost apps, and there were two ghosts um, in there. But there's been like some real like creepy stuff that has um, gone on it, at our store and even at our old store location. So yeah, um, it's it's creepy. Um, I'm sure there's some spirits that are definitely um, not at rest <laughs> for sure um, out there. So. Um, yeah, and I thought that um, the way he described, I was about to call it the hotel, um, but it gave me the um, American Horror Story hotel vibes and Mexican Gothic with the haunted um, building vibes, um, all of that. It was really, really good. Um, so I think I'm going to be the person who's not scared of stuff. <laughs> And I'm, it's not that I, I don't know. I, but like we've gone down to San Diego to the parts of San Diego that are supposed to be haunted, right? Like an old town and stuff. Um, we stayed at like the oldest um, hotel that is in San Francisco, one of the oldest hotels there for like a week. I don't know if it's haunted or not. I'm sure, um, I believe they say it is. And we, we were fine. Um, I, when I went up to um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I stayed at one of the oldest hotels there and it wasn't a hotel originally, it was a boarding house. Um, so, right, so it has like the shared bathroom and like you have your room. And I would say like that place probably definitely had like the creepy vibe, but I think it's one because I was like a woman alone and the back door to the back parking lot was by my room and that was like left open all night long. And I was like, that's not safe. Um, for anyone like if I have to leave to go to the bathroom like somebody could just grab me and no one would ever know like the front desk guy would never know and I would be dead but I think like I think you have like that old feeling like um what's the theater that Lincoln was shot at I can't think of it but like I've been there um and it has like an old feeling right like I think you have like that old vibe and I, I can feel that definitely, but um, my husband and I love old stuff and like collecting old stuff. And he was watching this scary show about um, a haunted library in, I think like Michigan or something. And then he was like, oh my gosh, you get all of those old books all the time. Like I just got a bunch of vintage books like um, from someone who passed away. Um, who we know. And he's like, are you afraid that like Billy's haunting those books now? And I was like, no. <laughs> and like I don't I don't think about that but it, they were talking about like the the books were haunted in this show so I think that I think that there's like a sense of oldness but I don't I don't necessarily get like scared I don't know I'm I'm a little less scared I'm more scared of like demons <laughs> and I'm scared of all of the above I'm also scared of the news so I'm a scaredy cat, um, but I do love a good thriller and I do love a good witch book because like Jana, you were saying, I'm fascinated by the like character of witches and the way that, um, you know, like historically speaking, there were like independent women who were like property owners that 
like people just wanted their land and stuff. So anyway, um, I love this time of year and I love like this like spooky story hour that we're having. So um, now we're gonna get into spoilers. So if you're new to the Papering Land Book Club, first welcome, but also we almost never do spoilers and if we do do spoilers, we give you fair a warning to push pause and finish the book. And it's because I always want you guys to join whether you have read or not because a lot of times you just get to hear us talk about a book and it'll inspire you to either read that book or hopefully it like jump starts your reading life. There's nothing I like more than listening to uh, other people who love books talk about their reading lives. So uh, with that, if you do not want to know the ending, um, we'll, we'll be here when you finish the book. And um, if you're here for it, let's do this. So number five is when did you realize the identity of the killer? So um, one thing that's really, really interesting is that the, this, this, the like folklore in the book was um, all about like these really crazy things, right, that happened on a blue moon in Halloween, on Halloween. And the first blue moon on Halloween is actually this Halloween. The last one was in 1944. So 76 years ago in the middle of World War II was the last blue moon on Halloween. So that would, so a blue moon is a full moon and, um, and it also is when there's two full moons in the same month. So this is the first time we have two full moons in the same month on Halloween since 1944. And I find that fascinating because that was such a big feature of the book. I just love when like our books like line up with real life. It's amazing. So um, like Jaina was saying, I'm really glad that I don't put too much stock in like reviews because like Kirkus reviewed reviews like skewered this book for predictability and just being like really tropey. And I'm glad I didn't read that before I selected it for us because I didn't find it to be tropey at all. Um, you know, like Jaina was saying, like all thrillers are gonna have a little bit of an element of predictability. Like when we read The Woman in the Window, like I had no idea who the killer was in that one. And that one was like a huge, like jaw-dropping payoff. Um, but yeah, I, I knew like he was involved, right? Like I guess we'll just say it. Like I knew it was really obvious Nick the Doctor was involved and Leslie was involved and Greta Manville were involved. Like it was obvious they were all like covering something up, but like I had no idea it was gonna be this like uh, black market organ robbing situation for rich people. Like I did not see that coming at all. Uh, that totally blew my mind and just the way that I loved the scene where she's in the Rose room, the Rose reading room, and I actually marked that passage. Um, and she's like researching all of this like folklore. And this is on page 277 at the beginning of chapter 39, um, where she's like, oh my gosh, I need to figure this out. I need to go to the library, relatable. And then she says, two hours later, I'm in the main branch of the New York Public Library, one of the many occupying the Rose main reading room. The library itself is bright and airy. Late afternoon sun slants through the arched windows. Puffy pink clouds adorn the murals on the ceiling. Hanging from it are chandeliers that cast circles of brightness onto the long tables aligned in tidy rows. And she talks about just this, like, this experience of studying in the Rose reading room. And I've never been to New York, so I'm like, I have to see what this is about. And I will link down below a tour of the Rose reading room. You can see, like, it's incredibly beautiful. I put on my list of, like, things I want to do is go, like, read at the Rose reading room. Um, and yeah, so I just love that, like, she was, like, studying and, like, trying to figure out the folklore of it. And then that ended up really did, like, parlay into, like, modern day. I just thought it was so well done and super fascinating and i mean i don't read a lot of thrillers but i didn't see it coming at all how about you miss anna yeah i don't read a ton of thrillers if i'm reading a mystery it's usually like something as cheesy like this that's like super cozy and i'll just keep it at that um but i was suspicious of nick from like day one but I did not expect him to be as involved as he was um like honestly I was expecting it to be the like the apartment broker <laughs> um and so the fact that it turned out to be the whole black market ring kind of terrified me um and 
honestly that scene from the rose reading room with the librarian i i am that librarian whenever i see people like checking out the occult books um like trying to keep it off my face but that is a hundred percent me i'm just like yeah here you go um please don't ask me for more of these um but yeah i would just i was so upset that i was wrong about who the actual killer was because i like being right and i was not um, and the whole blue moon thing being on Halloween this year made this even more creepy. I didn't realize that until you brought that up, Lisa Marie. So the, when you brought that up, I almost like threw the book out the car. Um, so yeah, this year I'm making sure that we're watching very kind of more hocus pocus movies during Halloween and locking all of my doors and windows. So thanks for that. I am going to the Halloween party, and then I was like, and then mom, I'll be sleeping Sunday, and I will be having a sleepover. <laughs> Sorry, are you good? I would start, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I keep it no, you're good, you're good, you're good. Um, so, yeah, I kind of always knew it was Nick. As soon as she um, hooked up with him, I was like, yo, yeah, he something, <laughs> he's probably the killer. Um, did I, I thought it was going to lean more towards the, um, the cult and some creepy, like, ghost spiritual god thing, but the fact that it was a black market twist was, I don't know, I just thought that was so great. I just started laughing, like, this is so, like, it is so great. Um, I'm sure like the mystery thriller book club uh, that I run at the store, I'm sure they would enjoy it. They would have enjoyed that that twist because they're like sick weirdos um, like me. But I just thought that was just, I did not see that coming with the, um, yeah, harvesting organs. <laughs> it just, yeah, I just thought it was great. But I knew at the gate, I was like, okay, the, um, that lady, the apartment manager is definitely involved. And I just knew like, as soon as she slept with Nick, I said, um, yeah, that's, yeah, he's bad. Yeah, I, I knew it was Nick from pretty much like the second she was taken up there to be doctored. Um, I was like, oh, this is like, he's going to be part of whatever. And he had, like, I knew that he had to be like, whoever was accessing like the room. Um, I didn't know how. I thought maybe he was going downstairs and coming up through the dumbwaiter or something like more complicated than how. Um, so I definitely knew. I did think it was like, maybe like more occult, like D, but I knew it was him. I knew what his relationship was going to be to the owner. I knew that they hadn't said his last name. I was like, Dr. Nick, like, what are we like, or like, on, are we like on the Simpsons? Like, right? Like, I, I just like, doctor first name. I don't know. That's always suspicious to me. <laughs> like, why did we not use his, his last name? Um, so I, I noticed that right away. And so I definitely knew he was involved and I knew that like possibly everyone else was involved because like when the fire happened and she went back to like go save um, like the dog, like people were like, oh, you're so nice. Like, I don't know, people were just being very strange about like how nice she was and like, like they didn't want to build relationships, and, like things like that. And I was like, okay, so I think everyone's in on this kind of thing. And, um, so yeah, I thought it was kind of clear. The organ harvesting portion, I did not necessarily see coming, but then once it happened, like they said it, I was like, oh, that makes sense. But I was, because I knew the, the two empty rooms upstairs, Nick was using them for something. I was like, he has access to that. Like he's doing something with that. Um, so I knew, I like, like I had like, pieces I just didn't necessarily see organ harvesting and I think that that's part of what actually makes this frightening is I think that there are definitely people who probably have the same attitude that is given and I think that this is 100% plausible and that is why it's scary because it is plausible there was like a story and it was two women in LA like I don't know if you've ever listened to the like um 
stay sexy and don't get murdered or like whatever it's called but it was I heard it it's like the only episode I've listened to of that podcast but it was these two women and they were like they worked at the church as volunteers and they would like get homeless men and help them and get them an apartment and then they would like help them get a bank account and then they would get like help them get an insurance policy like a life insurance policy but the two women would be the recipients of the life insurance policy and these were like homeless men who had no family and stuff and then they would kill them and like they did it like several years apart and it took like till I think the third guy before like they figured it out and they had started out in LA doing going into like expensive hotels and like doing like petty crime like pretending like they were guests and like stealing from like people's like purses and stuff at the pool and then they like escalated up to where they were like killing homeless men so like I thought about that when I, you know, like, I was like, this is plausible, like taking people who have no connections and killing them. Like it's completely plausible. Yeah, Jana, that I'm glad you brought that up because it's something I wanted to flesh out too, is I think that is what makes this story so incredibly haunting is that it 100% could happen. And I also think it was also creepy prophetic that this black market organ harvesting things started during the Spanish flu, right? Started during the last pandemic that we've had. Um, so the story, if you guys, you know, haven't read it or, you know, need a refresher is Nick's grandfather started the, the August harvesting because he didn't think it was fair that the rich and the poor were dying at the same rate from the Spanish flu. And, um, you know, a hundred years later, here we are in the next pandemic. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, I just thought that was an incredible stroke of luck, both like the pandemic setting, the blue moon, and yeah, that it just could completely happen. And for all we know, probably does happen, um, which is really scary. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. So that's also a really great segue into our last question, number six, which is, Sager, a man, seems to be prodding at society's dismissal of young adult women as disposable and also at fault, crazy, and in need of calm. <laughs> and, you know, something we've been talking about with picking titles for the next year is that I've kind of struggled a little bit to find thrillers for us because I'm a little bit tired of just like the victimized woman trope. It just feels like every thriller involves a victimized woman that is you know, deemed crazy or has some sort of health issue or all of the above, you know, um, and it's just like dismissed by society for some reason. So um, goes on to say, this is highlighted in the way Jules unceremoniously loses her job, loses her boyfriend, and ultimately her sanity, right? There's this sentence of madness, um, leaving her without viable options. On page 265, her voice is literally taken from her as she is physically silenced by two males who are ostensibly there to help her. Finally, she loses complete control of her body. Do you feel that theme is a through line in the novel and throughout the thriller genre? Um, so yeah, I think I kind of, <laughs> I, I just kind of said my thoughts. I, I thought this was just a really interesting take on like the victimized woman trope. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts, Miss Anna? So, yeah, I'm definitely with you with kind of being over the whole victimized woman trope, even in a lot of, like, fantasies. Um, like, early fantasies, it would always be kind of, like, women were just damsels in distress, and it would be get kind of old really quickly. Um, but for this book, I didn't really see it as Riley Sager prodding at society systems of young women I honestly saw this more of a prodding at society class distinctions and how society deems those who are on the outskirts for whatever reason but especially if it's based on like economic class and being utterly disposable um as someone who works in public libraries, I work, I see a lot of homeless people. I work a lot with homeless people. I live in a city that has a very large homeless population. And so it's like, I see how forgotten they get and which breaks my heart every time. And so I'm glad to be able to work with a company that does try and help them. Um, 
and it's just extremely a timely commentary to read this book which is talking about that um because all of those positions that were deemed essential during covid at least in my city are all those mostly minimum wage jobs that the upper upper class won't take um but i did think it was really interesting that you brought up this question when riley sager is actually a man um writing under a gender neutral name and i definitely rolled my eyes when finding that out um i don't want to assume sager's reasonings but i would assume it was just be to sell more books um because but yeah, I definitely think he did create a woman who starts out victimized and then is able to flip the table um, and comes out and coming out on top and being able to turn around and help people afterwards. And so I did really, I did appreciate that. Um, but it's definitely not something you see a lot in the thriller genre or even a lot of liter literary fiction either. Um, and so I, I'm kind of enjoying that shift from that paradigm as we're moving forward after in literature now. Slowly but surely. Um, I didn't really feel that, um, oh Lord, I just lost my train of thought. I don't think it's really a dismissal of um, young women. And I don't, um, I think there are a lot of mystery thrillers where you guess a young woman goes missing or dies and you got to find it. But um, maybe I am just, um, I don't know, I try to find at least for my mystery thriller book club and what I prefer to read is um, books that have a psychological twist. So it's not necessarily um, like a woman um, victim a woman as the victim it's usually just you know um players getting i mean players uh characters being just dumb and just not um just i don't know just not thinking and um getting played by somebody else um yeah i don't really think i don't know i didn't really um i don't know uh, maybe just because i just read a lot of um mystery thriller and also um one of my favorite um, authors, who's a man, um, and we always talk about this in um, our Mystery Thriller book club, he's a favorite, Peter Swanson, and he always writes from the male perspective. Every now and then he writes from a, a woman's perspective, but the killer almost always ends up being um, a man. And um, yeah, I don't know, um, <laughs> this one uh, customer, she said that, um, her friend said that Peter Swanson, um, his book is dumb because um, he writes his male characters uh, so dumb. And she's like, well, that just makes it great <laughs> because guys are dumb. So um, yeah, like I, I think they're idiots. So I don't know. I just read, I don't know. I read a lot of um, mystery thrillers. So I didn't really see like young like women being seen as disposable. Um, yeah, I didn't get that at all. I can see where this question is coming from because I did notice at first that like all of the victims, right? Like um, the previous ha inhabitant of her apartment, the woman below, um, right, Ingrid, um, they, they are all women and these women are disappearing. Um, I do think that Sager tried to indicate that both men and women were victims because then of what happens to Dylan, but maybe he's indicating that women who go to New York to make a certain life, just like women who come to LA, young women, um, struggle more. And if they end up in that position where they don't have a household, they are easy. They they are more likely to end up in this position possibly. Um, whereas, and not that young men don't, but I think. Um, I do think that men are maybe more likely to choose homelessness than women. Like women will try their hardest to find a place to stay um, because of uh, vulnerability. Women are much more vulnerable when homeless, right? Than men. Um, not that men aren't vulnerable, but there is a sense of that. So I don't know if that is something he's trying to explore and indicate that women who go to these big cities 
are more likely to end up in need suddenly of a situation like this. Um, but I, so I do see that. I, I do think he tries to redeem it a little bit with the Dylan aspect of it. Um, it did make me think when Lisa Marie was reading the question about like the descent of madness and like how she's dismissed about it, um, or the other women are dismissed when you look back at the way, what they said, um, that made me think of like the yellow wallpaper, right? And like how women are historically misunderstood and automatically called crazy when they see things, um, or are experiencing things like that's like the automatic, like oh, you're crazy. Um, so it made me think a little bit about that. Whereas like, they know this is really happening, but like, if we go and tell the authorities, they're going to like dismiss us because like, they're crazy. Um, that's about all I have. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, just, oh my gosh, so much to think about. I love it. Well, I think that concludes our discussion of our October read, Lock Every Door. Um, so November, we'll be reading Campaign Widows. I actually have it on my nightstand, so I don't have it um, right here, but the cover is so stinking cute, and I linked it right down below for you guys. So next up is to head over to Patreon to choose our titles for 2021 and co-create this beautiful reading community with me. I just refreshed all of the polling page, and it has so many that are like neck and neck like literally 50 50 48 52 so um now you guys are understanding a little bit well I go through when I choose titles it's like oh I could make a great argument for this one and a great you know argument for the other title and I love that these votes are almost like split down the middle so I'm going to be in suspense until November 3rd when we close the the title polling uh, as to which which are going to be our, our reads. And then as usual, just like every November for the last six years, I will be debuting our 2021 titles um, over on the main Paper and Glam channel. Um, and you'll find out the winners. So, and you also, when you do vote, you, you can see um, which titles neck and which title is, um, is winning. It doesn't show you until you vote, so you're not biased. But um, yeah, you'll see which is winning. But a lot of them like, you know, it's anybody's game right now. So that's really cool. Um, I think that's about it. So until next time, my favorite readers, I hope you have a beautiful Halloween. And also um, remember that book club is a week early next next month because of Thanksgiving. So all the dates and all the times are right down below for you. And um, I will see you over on Patreon for our books and reading live stream the second Thursday of the month. And then we'll be right here, same time, same place to discuss Campaign Widows the third Thursday. Happy reading, my friends. <laughs>